The team of experts led by the World Health Organization has departed Wuhan. That's after its probe into the origins of the pandemic. Hundreds of thousands of Chinese migrant workers are struggling as employers fail to pay their wages. Some say they've worked for up to a year without compensation. Biden's nominee for the Central Intelligence Agency is coming under scrutiny over his ties to China. And Beijing is writing a new set of rules, including guidelines for next-generation technology. The ambitious project is called China Standards 2035. Welcome to China In Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. A team of experts led by the World Health Organization departed the Chinese city of Wuhan on Wednesday. That's after four weeks of investigation into the origins of the Chinese Communist Party, or CCP, virus. After two weeks of quarantine, they visited some key sites and talked to certain people. The team spent three hours inside Wuhan's virology lab, a facility largely at the center of controversy over suspicions that it could have leaked the virus to the public. Later, an afternoon at the Huanan wet market, the location of the first known cluster of infections. The team also toured several hospitals and spoke with people pre-selected by Chinese authorities. They also accessed documents and inspected research done by Chinese scientists also all arranged by the Communist Party. The trip did not include conducting their own independent studies. The WHO probe comes one year after the pandemic broke out. And based on their inspection, the expert team says the possibility of a lab leak can be ruled out. Bats remain a likely source of the infection. And transmission of the virus via frozen food is a possibility and something worth investigating. The conclusions are notably similar to the CCP's narratives about the origins of the virus. A reporter asks U.S. State Department spokesman Ned Price if China provided appropriate access to the World Health Organization's team of experts. Well, I think the jury's still out. Um, I think clearly uh, the Chinese, uh, at least heretofore, um, had not offered the requisite transparency uh, that we need, um, and that just as importantly, again, the international community needs. The WHO team is already saying it's extremely unlikely the virus came from the Wuhan Virology Lab. Former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo told Fox News that he does not believe them. He notes that the Trump administration withdrew from the WHO because the organization had become corrupted and politicized. He said it was bending a knee to General Secretary Xi Jinping in China. A Chinese expert suggests China's pandemic control policy has put undue stress on citizens. His video has gone viral on Chinese social media. With good personal hygiene measures, people can really return to normal. If it doesn't return to normal in the end, it will lead to a mental breakdown. In mid-January, some Chinese cities were put back under lockdown orders amid new clusters of the CCP virus infections. The strict measures only allow one person to leave the house for groceries once every few days for a limited amount of time. Some locals have even had their doors sealed shut by authorities to keep them inside. Videos have emerged showing violators stopped by police or community guards, sometimes by force or violence. As of late January, three people committed suicide within eight days, just in China's northeastern Suihua city. Chinese media has steered clear of reporting on the cases. But following the reinstated lockdowns, netizens have shared news that similar situations are on the rise. The number of people who may have died at home remains unclear. Migrant workers in China often face poor treatment from companies. In some cases, that even includes not paying them. More than 200,000 Chinese workers say they've endured the issue. More from entities Don Ma. More than 2,000 migrant workers have been working for free without their consent. That's as companies appear reluctant to pay their salaries. This according to last year's data from China's Ministry of Human Resources and Social Security. Migrant workers in the construction sector are at the center of the problem. Data says their deprived salaries alone amounted to a whopping $400 million. Some workers haven't been paid for months, and some worked for up to a year for free. A worker from China's Anhui province tells us that he tried to demand his money back, but to no avail. The company he worked for defaulted on nearly $35,000 in unpaid employee wages. He kept delaying payments. 
He didn't want to give it to me. He is messing around. I've tried everything to try to get my money. The Labor Bureau, the police, and relevant departments are all in it together. Salary defaults are a serious issue, as jobs are hard to find in China. Some have been thrust into poverty because of it. As reported by U.S. radio broadcaster Voice of America, one family now relies on borrowing money from friends to buy food due to unpaid salaries. Workers' appeal to authorities rarely leads anywhere and often results in their arrest. A public welfare activist in mainland China tells us that this is because China's legal system is dysfunctional. The Chinese Communist Party is a dictatorial society. It has no law to protect the interests of laborers. There is no fair judicial justice process. Authorities are above the law. No one really cares about defending laborers or about defending the interests of migrant workers. An official mainland investigation found that salary debts in the construction sector generally dominate China's central and western regions. But this has been changing in the past year. Now, salary debts are piling up in China's eastern coastal regions and in the automotive, education, hotel and catering and online sectors. Don Ma, NTD News. Now we go to China's Sichuan province. Police brutality there recently reached a whole new level. Authorities beat a pregnant woman to the ground. The woman collapsed with a painful expression and her hand grasping her abdomen. She was part of a demonstration to protest the construction of a wastewater treatment plant. Its plant location is just over 200 yards away from a residential area. Demonstrators were beaten and pushed onto the ground. One woman was seen pinned down by three police officers. One of the officers placed his knee on her neck. For a time, the protest became one of the most searched topics on Chinese social media platform Weibo. Authorities tried to assure residents that the treatment plant was a one-year temporary project and would be torn down afterward. But residents remained skeptical. One pointed out that the project was valued at roughly $12 million. They say they don't believe such an expensive project would be removed after just a year. The Biden administration is facing criticism over its decisions to rejoin the United Nations Human Rights Council. The Trump administration withdrew from the council in 2018, citing that some of the worst human rights abusers were council members like China, Cuba and Venezuela. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken slammed the 2018 decision on Monday. He acknowledged the council is a flawed body in need of reform, but said Biden instructed the State Department to re-engage with the council. An observer in the council can submit draft resolutions, but does not have voting rights. Senator Marco Rubio from the Senate Foreign Relations Committee also criticized the decision. He said the council, quote, has become a place for despotic regimes to come together and receive international cover to continue to commit their horrific abuses. In January, then-Secretary of State Mike Pompeo designated the Chinese regime's persecution of the Uyghur minority in China's Xinjiang region as genocide. Senator Rick Scott also said the U.S. should, quote, reject engaging with an organization that turns a blind eye to genocide. Last week, 45 Republican House lawmakers sent a letter to Biden asking him not to rejoin the council. They reasoned it hasn't adopted any resolutions condemning countries like China and Cuba between 2006 and 2019. They say the Trump administration was right to withdraw because the U.S.'s participation has not led to any meaningful reforms. Now we turn to President Biden's pick for the country's leading intelligence agency, the CIA. The president has tapped William Burns to lead the agency, and media reports are bringing his ties to communist China into the spotlight. These reports focus mainly on a trip to China and donations from a man that's part of Beijing's influence organs. Burns is the president of a foreign policy think tank called the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. In 2019, Burns invited a group of congressional staffers on a trip to Beijing. There, the staffers met with a princeling, a foreign ministry official, and some academics. Princelings are the children of high-ranking Chinese Communist Party or CCP officials. Burns' organization paid for part of the trip expenses. The princeling in question is called Li Xiaoling. She is a daughter of a former regime leader. At the time, Li was the head of a group called CPAFFC. The U.S. as the group is part of the United Front Work Department. Beijing's overseas propaganda arm. 
The United Front Work Department is a key organ under the CCP, and it has a big mission, coordinating thousands of groups that push the party's influence campaigns overseas. The department targets Western politicians and business leaders and works to sway them in Beijing's favor. Another important political body that pushes the United Front effort is CPPCC, and one of its members joined the Carnegie Endowment's Board of Trustees under William Burns' tenure. The member, Zhang Yichen, donated over half a million dollars since he joined. Zhang is also the senior vice chair of a Beijing-based think tank. The leader of that think tank also works for the United Front Work Department. The Carnegie Endowment also received at least $200,000 in donations from the China-United States Exchange Foundation. The organization has also been accused of being a part of the United Front system. Burns is set to appear before a Senate confirmation hearing for his nomination. NTD reached out to him for comments but didn't get a response before airtime. A new bill in Congress is aiming to stop intellectual property theft by the Chinese Communist regime. It will ban senior Chinese Communist Party members from entering the U.S. Republican Congresswoman Debbie Lesko reintroduced a bill on Monday called Stop China's IP Theft Act. The bill aims to ban visas to the U.S. for senior Chinese Communist Party or CCP members, regime officials, active members of the regime's People's Liberation Army, or PLA, and their family members. Congresswoman Lesko believes the bill is necessary because the U.S. cannot continue to tolerate China's attempt to steal American intellectual property. She says the bill is critical in combating the global threat posed by the CCP. If the bill is passed, the ban on visas for CCP and PLA members will be in effect until the Director of National Intelligence certifies that the CCP has stopped sponsoring, funding, and actively working to infringe on U.S. intellectual property. Congresswoman Lesko first introduced the bill last November. This time, seven other Republican Congress members co-sponsored the new bill. Beijing seems to be hinting at what it wants out of the U.S.-China relationship. Chinese state-run media Xinhua News Agency published four commentaries in a row last week, calling on the Biden administration to, quote, lead the U.S.-China relationship back on track. The first commentary criticized the U.S. for what it called ruining the relationship over the past four years under Trump's administration. It also called the decision to treat China as a competitor or rival a historical error, adding that the United States' most urgent task is to, quote, correct itself and take the right path. The Trump administration had highlighted national security risks and relying on Chinese manufacturing and suggested the idea of decoupling the Chinese and U.S. economies. The second article commentary criticized U.S. policies, like restricting visas for Chinese researchers. Former President Trump had enacted visa restrictions for researchers with links to the Chinese military or affiliated institutions, citing risks of espionage and intellectual property theft. A third commentary criticized the Trump administration for decreasing U.S. investment in China, encouraging American firms to leave China, and suppressing Chinese firms in the U.S., while the last commentary focused on tech cooperation. Tech firms make up a large part of the Chinese companies blacklisted by the U.S. The label blocks them from doing business with American supplier. U.S.-based China affairs analyst Li Lingying says the Tsinghua commentaries were a display of what the Chinese Communist Party hopes the U.S. would change about the relationship. Li added the Chinese regime is laying its cards on the table and testing whether the new administration will fulfill Beijing's requests. Oxford University is set to rename a prestigious physics professorship after Chinese software company Tencent. It comes in response to a donation of almost one million U.S. dollars. According to UK-based outlet The Daily Mail, the university's Wickham Chair of Physics will be renamed the Tencent Wickham Chair of Physics. The professorship was established in 1900. It's named after William of Wickham, the bishop who founded New College in the 14th century. Tencent is accused of having close links with China's communist regime. According to the CIA, Tencent was founded with state support and financing from China's Ministry of State Security. Tencent also owns messaging app WeChat. The app is known to echo Beijing's censorship and restrictions on freedom of speech in China. 
One example is Dr. Li Wenliang from Wuhan, one of the first whistleblowers to warn other doctors about the dangers of the CCP virus. He used WeChat to get out the word, but was later silenced by police. Tencent, a Chinese company, signed a series of deals with UK broadcaster the BBC. The Chinese company is allegedly linked to the country's intelligence agency. According to the UK-based Daily Telegraph newspaper, Tencent worked with the BBC on its flagship programs, including co-producing Sir David Attenborough's Blue Planet 2. The partnership began in 2016. BBC's current director, General Tim Davey, was a key figure in signing the deal with Tencent's movie operations. Tencent allegedly received money from the Chinese regime's intelligence agency, and the company's app WeChat is accused of censoring politically sensitive content. An Australian state government is offering a $10 million loan to the Dolphin Tungsten Mine in Tasmania. The move aims to loosen Beijing's grip on the world's critical mineral supply chains. An additional $15 million of federal government support is currently being negotiated. The Dolphin Tungsten project has been closed for about 30 years, after tungsten prices fell in the 1990s. But the price is rising again due to increasing tech demand in recent years. Tungsten is the world's second hardest mineral after diamond and a critical component for high-end drills, electric vehicles and military hardware. Global tungsten production is largely controlled by the Chinese Communist Party. China produces more than four-fifths of the global tungsten supply. In recent years, Australia and the U.S. have moved to develop supply chains outside of Chinese control. Former U.S. President Donald Trump declared a national emergency last October over U.S. reliance on China for rare earth minerals. Trump also signed an executive order to look into enacting the Defense Production Act, which would fund mineral processing onshore or outside of China. Trump had explained he was planning to incentivize U.S. mining companies to pull their production operations from China and relocate back to the U.S. The Chinese regime is aiming to write the standards for the next generation of technologies, this with huge implications for global industries. And today's Penny Zhou has more. When the Chinese regime proposed its Made in China 2025 plan, it was accompanied by full-on state media propaganda campaigns. The ambitious plan aims to improve China's manufacturing power, but the U.S. believes the regime is doing so through massive state subsidies, unfair trade practices, and intellectual property theft. The Chinese proposal alarmed the West and triggered the wrath of former President Trump. I said China 25 is very insulting because China 25 means in 2025, they're going to take over economically the world. I said, that's not happening. The plan was cited when Trump decided to impose massive tariffs on Chinese goods. So this time, the regime is keeping a much lower profile when it brought up the China Standards 2035 plan. But this new strategy is no less ambitious. Instead of playing the game by ignoring the international rules, now the Chinese regime wants to write the rules. The specifics of the plan are soon to be unveiled, but an official document published last year has made the goals clear. The Chinese Communist Party, or CCP, wants to set global standards for the next generation of technologies. That includes 5G Internet, the Internet of Things, and artificial intelligence. Industry standards make sure products manufactured across the world can work seamlessly together. That includes everything from the size of light bulbs to how 5G data is transferred. But why is it a problem that the CCP wants to set the rules? One example may highlight what the CCP has in mind for the order of global technology. Last March, the Financial Times reported that Chinese telecom giant Huawei proposed to the United Nations an alternative form of the Internet. Huawei engineers argued that the free and open space that's owned by everyone is outdated and the world needs a new global network model. Under the new model, service providers would have complete oversight and control over every single device connected to the Internet through their service. In China's case, the service providers are often state-owned companies that answer to the CCP. This top-down design of the Internet will give governments much more control over the flow of information. And Huawei believes China should be the one building it for the world. 
Countries like Saudi Arabia, Iran, and Russia have previously applauded the Huawei proposal. Can the CCP succeed at making these rules? In fact, the regime is already making progress in influencing the international organizations that set the rules. Huawei's new internet proposal, for instance, was submitted to a UN agency called International Telecommunication Union. The Chinese regime now participates in 40 percent of the agency's study groups that set standards for future networks and security. That's versus a mere 5 percent from the United States. Communist China also holds the sixth most secretaries in the world's largest standard-making body, the International Standard Organization, or ISO. According to a report by the Congressional U.S.-China Commission, the U.S. share has declined steadily since 2008, with China's share tripled during the same period. Organizations like the ISO and the International Electoral Technical Committees are full of Chinese nationals. Some even occupy key positions. The strategy is similar to how the CCP sends its officials to occupy other UN agencies to exert its influence in them. According to a Wall Street Journal report, in 2019, the Chinese regime tried to block the ISO from certifying a standard for typing Cantonese, the primary language used in Hong Kong. The language is a crucial part of Hong Kong's cultural identity, but Chinese delegates argued it's enough to have just one official language for all of China, and that's Mandarin Chinese. The U.S. has previously voiced concerns that the CCP might export authoritarian norms in setting standards for sensitive technologies like facial recognition in video surveillance. Beijing has already started promoting its standard to developing countries in Asia and Africa through its Belt and Road Initiative. The Wall Street Journal reported that Beijing would offer subsidies for the countries to use its standards and make it costly for them to switch to international standards. Penny Zhou, NTD News. And that's all for today's China in Focus. Thanks for watching and see you tomorrow. Hi, we're happy to announce that you can also catch us on cable TV now. Millions of households already choose us as one of their trusted news sources, and you can too. You can watch us in Chicago, Washington, D.C., New York, and many other cities as well. And if your system doesn't carry NTD yet, you can just give them a quick call and request NTD on your cable provider. Thank you for watching. See you next time.